Hi guys, this is James from CAD9 Design LLC and I uh, thought I'd do a video on retopology tonight. Just basically going to get started in it. It's a pretty broad topic so I'm basically just going to go over the first things you do when you get a file. I'll uh, say, you know, you get an STL or an OBJ that you need to turn into like useful engineering CAD. Uh, which is probably the most common application you're going to see for read topology. Um, the next most common is going to be like uh, cleaning up uh, like sculpture meshes and stuff like that. So you can turn them into good nerve surfaces, but that's a bit more advanced. Maybe I'll do something on that later. Before I get into it, um, I just want to say thank you to everybody who subscribed. Uh, I had nine subscribers before the shout out from Martin Wintergarten. Uh, thank you, Martin. And in like 24 hours, I went to like 500. So awesome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you think that's something you want until it happens. And I got to be honest, I'm a lot more intimidated than I thought I'd be. I don't really have a problem with crowds or anything, but for some reason, on YouTube, it's just like a little more, I don't know, on the spot, I think, because. I'll see what I look like, you know, afterwards. That's awkward. Um, so, yeah. I'm not very good at this. Bear with me. Um, I apologize. I'm, you know, this was supposed to be something for me and my buddies. Uh, and it, uh, you know, <laughs> it's not that apparently. So, uh, if you got any tips on how I can do this better, uh, please feel free to leave them in the comments. Um, you know, something that doesn't take a whole lot of time and money on how I could like improve sound or picture or whatever. Uh, I'd love to hear it because I'm sure a lot of you know more about that than I do. So this model, um, to give credit where credit is due, uh, Eric's, or Erez Zuckerman, uh, the uh, CEO of Ergodox Easy, gave me this model. It's not a sponsored video. Um, he's just a nice guy. I use uh, one of his keyboards, well, two of them actually. And uh, if you don't know what an Ergodox keyboard it is, it is uh, Google it. Um, it's like an ergonomic split keyboard. It's all open source, and all the keys are fully programmable and stuff. Well, you can build them yourself. There's kits you can get and plans and all that. But uh, this guy, Erez, um, has a company that makes pre-assembled ones if you don't have the time to do that. And they are a little bit pricey, but, man, they're great. Uh, if you do this kind of stuff for a living, great, like, relief on your wrists. I was starting to get carpal tunnel, and I started using this, and it just went away. Not a sponsored video. <laughs> okay. So let's get into it. Uh, the reason I got this actually is I want to do a modded Ergodox housing. I'll have like machine a cool one out of aluminum or something. Maybe I could do like a little series on this start to finish. I don't know. That might be cool because I could go through the cam and then fixturing it and putting it on the mill and everything. Let me know if you want to see that. Maybe that'll, that'll be how I kick this thing off. <clears throat> okay, so the... Most of read topology like this is just modeling. So I'm actually, I'm not going to model it up today. I'm just going to go into the considerations of kind of how you do it and how my workflow goes on a simple part like this. First thing you want to do is find the scaling error. I say that because there's almost always a scaling error. Like, I don't know, 60% of the time, 70% of the time, the size is off. And that is because uh, mesh models don't really carry their units with them. So if something's modeled in inches and then converted to metric um, and exported, sometimes there's weird things that go on. Um, most common one I see is it's modeled in inches and exported, and then the importing software turns inches to millimeters, or the reverse of that. You know, So the thing's supposed to be 4 inches, and it's like 100 point or 101 point you know, whatever. Um, that's not right. You know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be an inch and it's 25.4 millimeters. Uh, so, like, it goes over and you open it up and it's like 25.4 inches. That's probably uh, one of your more common errors. 
or you know you open it up and it's like the model's huge or tiny and that 25.4 scale factor in either direction is uh, what the problem is the next most common one is a 10x scale factor because a lot of digital art software uh, things are modeled in centimeters and a lot of CAD software it's millimeters so that's the next one to look for <clears throat> and the third one which you still see a fair amount is combinations thereof things go back and forth between a couple of software platforms you might have uh, f like something really confusing like a feet to inches to millimeters or something like that so like you have to divide by 12 and then you see a number that you're like hey I think that's supposed to you know if I take you know a 25th of that um, you know that that's kinda in the neighborhood you know so you gotta be kind of a little bit of a detective with the scaling errors and you also have to keep in mind that STLs and OBJs aren't exact copies like very few points are exactly on that model they're modeled within a tolerance of that original surface so if this is a, a 25.4 scaling error you you know you might see like uh, an inch coming up as uh, you know 25.43 inches you know just because this light inaccuracy introduced by the STL kind of the snapping limitations in fusion as well it'll just snap to points to vertices like it's kind of weird but anyway you want to pick your largest measurement you think might be a consistent measurement and start there because your scaling errors are going to be the smallest proportionally on your largest measurements you know if uh, you're a tenth of a millimeter off on, on this length that percentage is so small as opposed to if you take it off this hole and you're a tenth of a millimeter off that's a significantly larger percentage of you know that dimension so that scaling error is going to get expanded out over the whole thing so you want to start like on your longest measurements that are easy to get so we're going to go to the measure tool here and see if this is some nice round number 1584 no luck um, doesn't really make much sense if I uh, divide that by 25.4 either. I happen to have the keyboard in front of me, so I know the actual size. But I'm, you know, I'm assuming you're working on a part where you don't. Okay, so this looks. This would probably be about four inches or 100 millimeters or something like that. Might be a nice round number. We'll check that next. And again, the snapping's kind of wonky. Like my guess at this point is a 10x scaling error. Let's see if this thickness is a standard. Okay, now when measuring thickness on a, an injection molded part with a lip, generally you're going to model this, you know, you, you've got the finished assembly in mind. This is kind of your measurement. This is kind of extra. This might, may or may not be standard this is more likely to be standard so that could be 13 millimeters and <clears throat> um, while I said <clears throat> um, go for your largest features sometimes it's just not an option like none of those are going to be like an even enough number for me to tell for sure Okay, here, this is encouraging, 103.604. Um, this is probably supposed to be 10 millimeters. That supports my theory. It's a 10x scaling error. That's kind of within the ballpark of uh, STL error. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, they tend to be the smallest features, but they also tend to be the most accurate, and that's holes. Um, if these larger measurements don't succeed, holes are just about always standard. It's very rare you come across a hole that's not a standard size. Now, if this is metric, this is going to be most likely uh, on a even millimeter size. 
or possibly a half millimeter if it's a smaller hole. It's, you know, very rare do you uh, get a part like this and, and this hole is not some standard size. So let's check this distance. 29.971, that's really close to 30, which would make this a three millimeter hole, which would make perfect sense for the application. So you can grab a few holes around like this and see what they kind of, whoops, what they kind of cluster around. Yeah, that's definitely looking like it's going to be 30 millimeters. See there, we got one that's just over. Yeah, I'm 99.9% .9 sure. So let's close that. <clears throat> so this is my original data. This is the file I want to drop that in. I don't like to edit my original data. However, I do make an exception for scaling errors. I will scale this properly. Now, something to keep in mind when you are scaling, if you open the scaling tool <clears throat> and you pick your body, it's automatically going to uh, make that the scaling point wherever you clicked on. You can change that here. I typically use the origin just because it's a nice consistent reference point and I scale from the origin. Um, you can also pick the body here. And I don't know how it picks that point. It just seems kind of random. You'd think it would be the center on mass or something. But one thing, if you pick this and then pick your scale tool, it seems to be a consistent like center of the bounding box. So if you want to shrink around your center, which would be my second choice to the origin, uh, pick your body and then pick the scale tool and it will default to the center of that. But let's do our origin in this case. And let's do our 0.1 scale. And let's inspect. I'm happy with that. All right, so we'll save that. Go over to this guy. Show our origin here. Okay, it's in a reasonable place. I usually don't move that stuff, but uh, it's kind of nice to uh, see where it's at, because sometimes it's way off in space somewhere, and that's kind of annoying. I'll flip this over so the floor is underneath, you know, in a kind of logical bottom. Hey, look, that's right on that corner. That's nice. And, uh, okay. So now we got this in here. We got this scaled properly. Um, okay, that origin's hidden, so that's this native origin. Oh, actually, I do want to leave that on because I want to show you something. First thing you want to do uh, with an injection molded part before you start modeling is just look over it um, and look at your wall thicknesses and stuff because it's going to uh, affect how you model this later on. These are all the same wall thicknesses. You can kind of design all your features and then just shell it. Um, if the wall thicknesses vary, which honestly they should um, to a certain extent, like ribs should be thinner than the outside walls, etc., etc., um, then you're going to have to like uh, model certain things, shell it, and then model other things. So I always do a section analysis. Grab one of these planes and uh, look at places like this. See how consistent we are. <clears throat> okay, so we got thick, thin, thick. That's not ideal. It doesn't really matter. Like uh, uh, in this part, it doesn't actually matter. But like ideally, you go from thicker to thinner, and then this should be the same thickness as this. But uh, again, uh, it doesn't really matter. That's just me being picky, you know. Uh, because it's, you know, 
textbook versus good enough. Um, just kind of double check our draft angles and all that kind of stuff. But you want to see if there's any kind of weird spots because a lot of times you're going to get something and you're going to be tasked to make this manufacturable. And the scope of work, you know, you might have taken as make it manufacturable as in make it like something that's a clean step file. Um, but there might actual be actual manufacturability issues that they want you to address, and that's outside of the scope of work. So if you come through this and you were supposed to make an exact copy and you see something kind of wonky, you know, you can tap the client on the shoulder and let them know. Because a lot of times you're dealing with people that don't have the same technical knowledge you do. So you kind of, you know, you, you kind of want to, don't always take them so literally, you know, you kind of want to uh, tap them on the shoulder. And even if, um, you know, as long as you don't bore them, you know, even if they're like, oh, no, that's fine or whatever, they, they at least know you're looking out for them. Okay, so you want to have a look for any manufacturability issues. Now, here I'm not actually going to be copying this thing exactly unless everybody's just dying to see that. Um, I'm going to be making like a machined aluminum version of it. Maybe I can use that later, so I'll leave that there. Okay, so now, um, sorry about the voice. I'm getting over a head cold. <clears throat> so now, we want to think about how we want to model this. I'm not actually going to model it, but um, you kind of want a certain order of operations. Those are inconsistent wall thicknesses. So this outside wall, the shell is all one thickness and then these are different. So you're going to have to model this as a block and then shell that and then model this inside stuff. Now the logical place, what I always tend to do with injection molded parts, uh, at least where it's applicable, where it's you know like a flat clamshell type mold, <clears throat> it's my sort of original construction plane. I would make this surface here. That way I'm drafting this way and this way and it's kind of along the split line. So, you know, because when you're when you're designing an injection molded part, um, you're always thinking about that split line. You know, that affects everything. So when you're uh, retopologizing, for lack of a better word, um, actually there is a better word, it's reverse engineering. Um, you kind of want to mimic that original design process as much as possible. Meaning, you know, you do your basic shapes first, then you do your fillets, um, and et cetera, et cetera. And also, part of that is uh, kind of doing the order of operations and, and how they would model it as close to original as possible. Because that's going to make editing more logical and clear down the line. <clears throat> so, in order to do that, I'll do an offset plane. I won't pick like three points on an STL to do a plane. It's just a bad idea. Um, the margin of error, is like there's just too much error in that. Um, you want to, like if sometimes you have to do it because if things turn funny in space or whatever, but uh, you want to pick a work coordinate system. And that's what you want to use, like, uh, you know, so you know it's truly parallel to your work coordinate system. Now we can drag this up. And this looks like the bottom is like that. You know, like the actual work coordinate system zero plane is also the bottom of this thing. So we can look and see if this is a nice round number. Oh, that's in inches. Let's cancel that. And switch this over. I have to go back and forth a lot, so I uh, kind of have to dual wield, so I'm always in the wrong units when I open a file up. Okay, let's grab this guy again. That's better. 
14.371. So it probably won't be a nice round number. But eyeballing this is honestly good enough because you can get this within the accuracy of whatever the SCL was modeled to um, and within whatever the manufacturing tolerances are going to be pretty easily. So don't get too uh, OCD about making that a nice round number. And after you do that, here's just another thing for if anybody's going to be in this file after you, try to kind of drag your plane around so it sort of sends a message of what this plane is for here it kind of encapsulates the part so it's gonna you know imply construction plane like if I was modeling this boss separately I might just drag a little plane like that so they could see what planes were associated with what features Okay, then you're going to do your uh, create sketch. <clears throat> you're going to model your perimeter. You're going to extrude it with a draft. Extrude that one with a draft um, after you know, but you know, picking up off of this line or whatever. So you can extrude that with a draft. You're going to do all your fillets after that, or rather, you're going to do this angle. Then you're going to do all your fillets, and then you're going to shell. You can't, you, you don't want to model these holes before you shell. Some of you are probably saying, hey, but then I'll have this, the whole wall around it already. But that wall is a different thickness than the rest. So you don't want to do that. Like, um, you want to go ahead and shell, then you're going to uh, make a sketch and you're going to cut a hole and you're going to make a, you know, ring around it and extrude that out. Or you're going to extrude a boss and then you're going to model a hole and, you know, extrude that. So after you get all that, you'll be able to, you know, do the profile for this lit, do the rest of this stuff, and, you know, it's no longer retopology now, it's just basic modeling. And, you know, when you're done, you're done. So uh, uh, next time around, maybe I can go into some more detail on, uh, like, copy any irregular surfaces or things that are a little bit more tricky like this. But you know, this modeling is all pretty basic. Um, at least for my target audience, I guess you'd say. I'm really sorry about my voice. <coughs> so yeah, this model is pretty basic at this point. This is just, you know, extrusions and bosses and construction planes and whatnot. So I'll, uh, you know, I'll wrap this part up here. If um, you want to see uh, something in depth on modeling for injection molding, uh, this might not be a bad model to do that with, but I'd probably do something where I'm starting from scratch. Uh, anyway, uh, hope that uh, helped uh, you guys out there and thank you guys all for subscribing. Um, Hopefully you're not unsubscribing after seeing this. <laughs> uh, and yeah, let me know what else you might want to see. And uh, I guess that's it. <laughs>